I, Dr. James Wesley, place this testimony here as a record of the events leading up to the death. Um, no. Leading up to the genocide of everyone that worked at the corporate office of Osset Pharmaceutical found in Washington State. We were told that the work we were doing was going to help people. This started last spring. I got a call from the headmaster at Carbuncle Academy. I'd been studying medicine there for nearly three years and never once was asked his office, so the thought of being summoned actually terrified me. Marsh was as old as dirt and as stern as a brick wall. He smoked a pipe, wore clothes that looked like they belonged in the 1930s. As I entered his office, he played a vinyl record on an old player and let classical music fill the air. He told me to close the door and asked me if I was familiar with the piece, to which I admitted that I wasn't. According to him, the music was created by a local cult leader back in the 1880s named Abraham Zwayne. The headmaster explained that Zwayne had managed to convince hundreds in the area to kill themselves due to a meteor shower. If I might ask, why are you telling me this, sir? His bizarre ramblings about ritualistic genocide had left me unnerved, and I, I wasn't entirely sure what the purpose was of my arrival to his office. He puffed his pipe again and focused his old pale eyes on me before explaining that a rumor had spread across the academy campus that I was involved in extracurricular activities with questionable students. I didn't lie. I have no intention of concealing the truth from anyone that hears this tale. Full disclosure is necessary in order for guilt and blame to be placed where they belonged. When I arrived in Carbuncle Academy three years ago, one of my first interactions with the students was actually near the East Gate. Another student, a senior, had just plummeted from the rampart and smashed their skull all over the courtyard below. Dozens of students and teachers, they were trying to get a look at this grisly scene. One in particular, a young medical orderly named Herbert, told me that the student who had committed suicide, he had been involved in strange behavior surrounding a church that sat in the South Courts. I had always had an inquisitive mind, and it bothered me that someone with a bright future ahead of them would toss it all away after a single visit to an old religious institution. So I traveled there myself. According to others I met during my time here, many believed the church was not made by human hands. It had otherworldly feels about it, and people gathered there to express their interest in the unknown. The leader of these congregates was named Severn, Thomas Severn, and he greeted me like a sheep to be brought to slaughter. Considering how easily I was roped into this mess, that analogy proved true in many ways than one. Severn explained to me that the land around Carbuncle Academy was considered sacred by the local police, and of course, the immigrants that settled and took over and built the academic buildings had no interest in such superstitions and plundered the land of their own benefit. The church, he claimed, was the only one remnant of the old world. I asked him about the strange rumors surrounding the church and the student that had committed suicide. He told me that there were star charts that some students studied here in the church that the teachers considered questionable. Apparently they showed systems that didn't match modern astrology, and therefore they were deemed inferior. The student that had jumped from the wall had somehow learned more about these charts, and that knowledge had caused him to end his life. I told all of this to Headmaster Marsh, explaining that ever since that encounter, I had dabbled in the esoteric, along Herbert and Severn. I had come to theorize that the charts which had baffled so many were actually not showing any stars we were familiar with at all, but rather from an age long past, when the skies were still luminous in the area. I also, I admitted to him, believed that the charts were created by visitors from the stars. Saying such things out loud made me feel foolish in front of such a learned man, but to my surprise, he only puffed his pipe and nodded in agreement. 
I had heard you were writing such papers under a pseudonym, trying to see if any of the other teachers in the academy agreed with you. As it turns out, there is a chapter of this school's history that has been covered up which relates to your own investigations, and that's where the story of Zwayn comes in. Headmaster Marsh explained to me that the board of directors had agreed to keep the works of Zwayn under lock and key almost a hundred years ago, but over the past few generations, things got forgotten and a few of the papers that the cult leader had written were able to leak, and the star charts in the books I had been studying at the church in secret were actually part of those papers. Are you saying there is truth to the ramblings of a fictional story where he claimed to have seen aliens? I asked. The story, which I can summarize, connected to the meteor shower that Marsh had already told me about. During the late 1800s, Zwayne said that large, monolithic objects fell from the sky all across Dunwich County. He believed these objects were actually from the Earth's moon, and they revealed that these aliens were living amongst us. It had sounded insane when I studied it, but the papers had included detailed descriptions of the aliens and illustrations. The beings looked like massive slugs, with thousands of eyes and skin as smooth as moon beasts, he called them, and he claimed that the crash of the monoliths was the first step in their plan for coming to Earth. We had hoped to keep these matters private but because of your own meddling. We've attracted the interest of a third party. Someone that wants to invest in this goose chase, Marsh told me. And to my surprise, he told me that this new company wanted to hire me full time as a medical professional. You understand, of course, this sort of employment would be off the record and the Academy would deny any involvement, Marsh warned. I was still dumbstruck by this sudden turn of events, so I did my best to keep my feet on the ground and recap what was happening. So, a fresh-faced entrepreneur company wants to hire me as a medical professional based off my theories related to esoteric magic and star charts from ancient cults, I asked rubbing the back of my neck sheepishly. I mean, it sounded a bit outlandish. That's all we know. A Mr. Lang is meant to contact you shortly and give you further details, but I should also advise this is not the sort of position you turn down, James. Your papers made the Academy look bad. We're doing you a favor by letting it slide and getting you out of their hair rather than kicking you onto the streets. I grit my teeth, trying to think fast as I stood up and looked at his taxidermy trophies. If that's the case, then it'd be awful for anyone to realize you were ostracizing me just because I spoke the truth. I countered. Marsh raised a weary eyebrow. He knew I was threatening him. What do you want? All we want is to make this go away. Let Osset have the headache, he said tiredly. I knew my demands before he even finished speaking. Herbert and Severn, their expertise in these fields exceeds mine, and in their hindsights will be valuable. They'll be joining me for the new assignment, I told him. Marsh promised he would make it so. And so, he did. I didn't really pay much attention to the details of our transfer to the small town of St. Malvas. There was a clinic there that was reopened for Osset a few months back, and that was where I went to meet Lang. He was a tall, dark-haired Asian man with a brutish spirit, and most of that first meeting is a bit of a blur. I was too eager to find out what sort of work my colleagues and I would be assigned to pay attention. Especially because I knew it meant some of the theories I had written about might be true. When I expressed such excitement to Lang, he promptly offered to give me the charts and notes 
that were connected to the scandal the Academy so vehemently wanted to cover up. The Zwayne Incident, he called it. For posterity, I will provide a short summary of what we found in those notes before I explain what we did with this knowledge. Despite being a religious zealot, I was surprised in the writings of Abraham Zwayne to find that he was a learned man, and he studied astrology and philosophy quite avidly. He included quotes from Shintoism and even ancient Mayan texts in his writing, which all centered around the belief that the world we live in is not the only one that exists. In short, Zwayne saw through the monoliths a secondary realm that exists alongside the one we live in. The true world, as he called it, starkly different than the flourishing life of Earth. Zwayne said on the other side of the mirror, life hardly existed at all. There were long, streaking lines of white and strange tall buildings that defied architectural standards of our world. Corridors and stairwells that panned whole galaxies and seemed to circle black holes. He theorized that these places were connected somehow to the star charts from the church, and the church itself was in fact a conduit which held more power in our universe than others. A conduit, he claimed, was the result of the collective memory of the culture around that spot. The longer the collective memory could recall details about the location of the true world that existed there, the longer that location would still exist in our world as well. This explained why the members of the congregation felt an otherworldly connection. When they saw and prayed in the pews, they were actually sliding in and out of an alternate dimension. We're hoping we can try to learn some more about this collective memory that he spoke about. We begin trials tomorrow, Lang explained. I should have further questions about all of this, but the sheer excitement to be a part of all groundbreaking discovery was so overwhelming, I kept them to myself. The next day, we had about a dozen people show up to participate in what Lang called a clinical trial. The drugs we administered here are not FDA-approved, of course, so we will be signing waivers and non-disclosure agreements. You'll be paid once the six-week period had come to an end. In private, he explained to me that each patient would be given a slow drip of psychedelic drugs and other substances that were designed to enhance neurological functions. I began the tests immediately. It took less than 48 hours for one of the subjects to die. I like to say that I knew their name, or that I understood why they had died, but I... I can't say either of those things because I would be lying. I just finished a shift rotation on the other side of the facility where we work to manufacture the equipment of the samples when I heard a loud scream from the patient area. My natural instinct was to run and assist. Herbert was there holding down his patient as she screamed horribly and shook and vomited. After a full recovery about an hour later, I took the time to obtain a statement. You were given approximately four doses before you experienced this unfortunate side effect. Could you describe what caused this or what you feel went wrong? The patient was looking at us like, like we were strangers even though we had been there for a while now. True, we hardly knew each other, but the level of distrust was disheartening. I encouraged openness, especially due to the health benefits. I'm starting to think that might be a lie she said, as she coughed up more blood. Per standard protocol, I urged them to explain what caused their outburst. You'll think I'm crazy, but I saw something sleeking in the shadows. I felt like I was back there in those corridors. I was running from it. The halls never ended, and the strange shadow just kept getting closer. I was soon aghast to discover that Four other patients had similar experiences, and I had missed them. That couldn't be a coincidence. When I told Lang about it, his response troubled me even more. Increase their dosage, monitor their brain activity. I want to get a clear picture of what they're seeing the next time they have an episode. Are you suggesting we actively place our patients in harm's way? I asked. We're only letting their mental state be at risk, 
Their physical bodies remain here. They have no means of crossing over to the other side, and neither did the creatures that they are envisioning, Lang said dismissively. I wasn't so sure that was a solid excuse, but I was obeying orders still, not questioning the methods. I wanted to learn more, and it felt like we were finally making progress, and I did as I was told. The results began to trickle again over the next month. Our patients were sharing the same nightmare. I documented what I could, and I found the notions even more terrifying than I care to admit. The first pair, a man and a woman, reported that the dream consisted of a labyrinth, much like the ancient Grecian myth. This one seemed to be haunted by beasts that clawed at my patient's mind long after they woke up. The bear, it reeks of death. It haunts us relentlessly. We walked in the halls for days, trying to find a place to hide, but each path we took, even if it felt like we were going forward, he wound us back up around the core of that awful maze. When they described the maze, the third patient said sometimes there were doors and stairs. They didn't always appear, but when they did, they would lead to different segments of this starry world. One led to a hotel. The rooms were always empty, but the patients would talk about screams and crying in the empty rooms. Something trying to dig its way out from under. They often felt like their feet were heavier when they went inside these rooms, so they marked them as dangerous and avoided them as best they could. Another talked about a forest. They found his framework quite interesting because it seemed uh, to follow the same principles as the hallways. The forest would snag and twist about, circling a lonesome mountain that the patients never seemed to be able to reach. They would hear distant static that was luring them to the mountain, but the closer they got, the more the massive landmass would remaneuver itself. Lang called these infinite corridors the key to our knowledge of the world. He wanted more information and told me to continue to increase the dosage. It all seemed to be progressing until the first suicide. It had been almost three months since we started these human tests. Most of the people we were using had lost sanity. Others seemed to have been driven to stay inside the dream world and refused to wake up. The patient that passed away was actually one of Herbert's. A young man that came to the clinical trial for money to support his family. He only meant to stay a week. He was given the max dosage to enter the shared consciousness faster and we documented what we learned via a new method Lang wanted to try, where the dreams were projected onto a screen. The subject, who I must admit I, I never learned the name of, was immediately thrust into the corridors as soon as the syringe pierced his skin. His readings were familiar to someone who had fallen from a great height. There were rows of doors in front of him, all marked very similarly with the number three on them. He approached the first one, tested it out, swinging it open to see another corridor that stretched for miles with glowing blue lights on either side. Before he went in, the subject tried the next door, found the exact same thing. Then they tried another door and another and another, until they were surrounded by open doors that all seemed to be leading to blue, fiery hallways. They reluctantly entered, and I whispered to Herbert if he had ever seen this portion of the alternate dimension before. I've been doing some studying in their mental health as they went to the true world. If I'm not mistaken, the halls and mazes they find in there, they're of their own making. Each time it tosses into this labyrinth, they make new pathways that intersect and grow the maze, he told me. I was fascinated by that theory, but too focused on the feed to provide any sort of insight on what that might mean. There was a single door in front of the subject. This one was already open. And inside there was a slender woman wearing a familiar outfit. Looks like the uniforms from Ma said, I commented, 
trying to get a better look at the woman. She was a redhead with sparkling blue eyes and, I'll admit, even attractive. She was mouthing words we couldn't understand to the subject, and I was trying my best to keep an eye on his physical reaction. Whatever she's saying to him is causing quite a spike in his adrenaline, Herbert said, as he reached for the device that would take the subject out of the dream. Wait, wait, we need to see what happens. This could help us, I said. I regret pushing things that day. The woman kept talking, though. Levels kept rising, and then at the end of whatever speech she had given to our subject, she took out a syringe. It reminded me of the same one we administer to place them within the dream. She plunged it into the patient's neck, and in that instant, they woke. They gasped for air as if they had been drowning, their gaze confused and fearful as they looked at us. What happened in there? Yeah. But they didn't respond. Before they even dared to try and comprehend the situation, the patient jumped from their bed and ran towards the nearby railing. They ran straight on past the railing, falling to their death without even a scream passing their lips. An autopsy revealed nothing out of the ordinary for their brain function. Lang considered the whole incident just a simple misunderstanding and miscalculation. I wasn't sure. I kept replaying the footage of the blue-eyed woman in my head over and over. Who was she? Did she work for us? What had she told the subject to make them want to kill themselves? Over the next weeks, those questions were compounded by even more issues with the patients. Some were refusing treatment, harming themselves to stop the dreams. They just, they just wanted to go home. They felt sorry for them. But Lang insisted their work was hardly finished. We've only scratched the surface of what this maze is, what sort of abilities it could give us. We need more players in this game, James. Can you, can you help us? I knew what he was asking. He wanted me to be a recruiter. I played that part quite well. I went back to the academy this time as a representative of the Offset Company. Even though this campus had been a part of my home for nearly two years, stepping back into it now was overwhelming. I didn't feel very welcome anymore. A few students stopped, saw my badge that represented Offset, made a few hushed comments amongst themselves, then they zigzagged around to avoid being near me. I turned turned about to ask what they were saying when someone bumped into me and dropped their coffee on my clothes. Just watch it! I said, jumping back and looking at the young woman. She had curly red hair, freckles, blue eye. She reminded me of the same woman I had seen in the visions of our patients. But how was that possible? I'm so sorry, are you okay? She asked as I tried to ignore the burning liquid that covered my shirt. That's, uh, fine, fine. Do I, do, do I know you? I said, as I helped her gather the papers she had dropped. I couldn't help but notice the familiar esoteric symbols and graphs on the paper. Was she a student of Zwayne's teachings too? I don't think so, but... You know me now. I'm Emma Carter, she told me as she spotted the logo on my shirt. You're with the corporation we're contracting with, she asked in surprise. You're familiar with us. Headmaster Marsh made an announcement about a month ago that we had a new, a new internship program happening with the company, but I'll admit that's not the only time I heard about you. Let's just say that there are a few ugly rumors circling about the people who go to work for them. 
Rumors. What kind? She pointed toward a nearby study lounge, and I followed her to discuss this privately. You probably know this firsthand, but the people who go to work for you? They never come back and finish their studies. They... They disappear. I can see it in your eyes. You know it's worse than that, Emma said, while I averted my gaze. I thought about some of the things that had happened to the patients I'd tested with. I didn't want to think that we were hurting them, but I couldn't deny it was dangerous. Some of them had already tried to off themselves, and some... Some had been successful. I'd been pushing these things out of my mind, focusing on the end game of the research, but something about the way this young woman spoke to me made me pause and realize I was being a monster. What is it? What do you know? I know that we've been dabbling in scientific discoveries that will shake the very foundation of our entire human race. Alternate dimensions that connect via endless halls. I, I paused. I paused to see if any of this sounded familiar, and... I decided to make a guess about her studies. It's what Pastor Zwayne was researching almost a hundred years ago, am I right? Emma actually looked surprised I was so forthcoming. I think I might know something that can help you, she told me. She wrote a time and a place for the South Dormitory to meet that very night. A group of us have been getting close to unlocking what Zwayne learned all those years ago. Bring your own calculations, and I think... I think we can reach a solid understanding of this alternate dimension. I'll admit. I'll admit I was stunned she knew so much about this subject. It made me think about what I had seen in that vision. Was that... Was that an alternate reality where Emma had already become a member of Osset? Yet she was transforming my patients into monsters in that nightmarish place. I thought if I decided to help her and we discovered a way to enter the true world right here on this campus, would it cause the same inevitable reaction for her in the future? Was this what fate was? I didn't have an answer, but the questions troubled me. It felt as though an unseen force was pushing me along. I didn't even feel that my free will was existent as I realized the only course forward would be to meet with Emma and the other Zwayn acolytes. Whatever this power is, it wants us to find it. The true world was almost within reach, and new information that could reinterpret the entire universe. As a man of science, I felt there could be no other way to go. I checked the map of the campus and where Emma wanted us to meet. The location was obvious. The dark church, where all of this started almost a hundred years ago. I took a break at the cafeteria and took off my coat to eat a fine lunch. With my logo hidden, none of the students gave me dirty looks. It was nice to think about my days as a learner here. So much had changed since then. The reflection made me feel guilty because of how I was now using these same students for the experiments of Osset. What did I become? I lost my appetite with that thought collected my things, and went towards the dark church. At this time of day, the ancient structure was empty. Candles were lit, though, from a morning service, and I saw several books laying on the ground around what looked like a magical sigil. I knew better to think this was mundane act of worship, so I leaned forward to get a better look at the written words. But what I saw made little sense. At least at first. Hrak-gla, Grengliak, Alvak, 
Befla, Shora, Zhongle, E. As I kept repeating it in my head, somehow the translations came to me as if, as if the book was telling me what I was trying to convey. Here the disciple Blyfell lies. In sleepless nights, he bleeds. Kith on, kith on, nonwa, in la, daxva, vapai. Awaken his chaos, let loose his fury. A pit formed before my eyes, the endless void ripping open to give me a glimpse into eternity. This, this was the true world. I looked around, I should have been waiting for Emma, but, but the new portal beckoned for me to investigate. From the shadows I saw light, beautiful and ancient. It swirled and shimmered and shook the room. Immediately the candles fell down onto the ground, the fire shaking and transforming as blood and dark slime was emerging from their wax, feeding this nameless monster. In the walls around me formed reflections of my own self. No longer was I standing in the Carbuncle Academy. No longer was I in the world I knew and loved. This was something else, dark and mysterious, yet it only spoke to me the truth. As the swirls of anger and blood formed a shape, its unimaginable face became clear to me, and when I saw what the mirror was showing me, I screamed. The reflection shattered into millions of pieces, and I realized how, how foolish we had been to even step foot into this place. I saw others trapped in a labyrinth. Ones that I hadn't met, I could only assume they came from the other timelines or other dimensions, wandering this place and becoming faceless monsters. They could, they could smell my fear. I stepped forward to try and get the attention of one that looked almost human. He had cut out his own eyes and he was mumbling, mumbling about like a madman. We cannot see the world beyond ours, for it invites death. Every path, every direction, it leads only to our extinction, he whispered as I passed by. The other creatures were feeding on themselves, crawling and making hallways of flesh as I ran through to find Emma, or to find anything that reminded me of the same reality I'd come from. I saw her at last, standing like she had in the first vision, with a syringe in her hand, but she wasn't alone this time. The tunnel of flesh fell away, and I was trapped. I was trapped in a white room with no clear dimensions. Carter stood there next to an operating chair, and beside her was an older man, perhaps in his early nineties, who greeted me cordially. You're the one we have to thank for this new discovery. So I've heard. It's a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Wesley, he said. How do you know me? I asked. My voice sounded hoarse. The walls of this place whisper your name often. Almost every iteration of these endless corridors, your name is the one that these beings chant whenever we ask who sent them here. It would seem that the entities that control this corridor have used you and people similar to you in almost every single dimension to keep themselves fed. You were puppets, pulled here by, by forces beyond your understanding, and now... Now the threshold widens, and a new reality will be swallowed up, he said. The experiments. They weren't unlocking any potential for humanity. This was always a trap, I realized. Took you long enough, Emma said, as strange faceless beings strapped me down. What are you going to do to me? You don't belong here anymore. There's still other places where a harvest must take place. We can handle the workload here, and you, you will remain our puppet. I looked at the older man, a realization of who he was. You're Swain? The one that killed those students all those years ago? Kill? Oh, heavens no. I awakened them to their full potential. They're here, part of the endless tapestry. This shared consciousness is a way for our species to live forever, Jane. What I have done is give them immortality. 
Emma plunged the syringe into my neck. I'll fight this. I'll find a way to save you, I told her. She looked sad. Her eyes told me she believed it was too late. The walls of flesh began to close in. I was drowning in their vitriol and then coming up for air in the dark church. My hands were clammy and shaky as I walked away from the ritual circle. The Emma I knew was in the doorway, a bit perplexed by my strange behavior. Dr. Wesley, are you still trying to recruit us? She asked. No. No, sweet child, you have to flee from here. Only devil's work is being done here. We have to get away, I told her. Emma didn't want to leave with me that evening, and it was the last chance I got to speak with her. I sent in my resignation to Osset the following evening as I caught a train to Clear River. They didn't seem to hold a grudge, but instead pressed forward with their work to map and understand the labyrinth underneath. I tried again to reach out to Emma, only to learn that she'd, she'd already decided to join the corporation. Feels like no matter what I've done, fate's found a way for the endless halls to grow. The doors to grow more numerous. So I suspect that many others will find their way to these back rooms of the mine and become trapped there. Spread this warning. Stop this madness as much as you can, please. Please, we might not be too late. At the very least, we might be able to be prepared for what comes next. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepy Pasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepy Pasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sullyman, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.